So we have seen so far a form of discriminant analysis based upon the assumption that for each of the populations, pi j, data x from these populations has a multivariate normal distribution with some mean and some shared covariance matrix. In this section, we're going to look at a related method, but a method that doesn't make any assumption about the distribution. So we don't assume multivariate normal distributions. We don't make any assumptions of the data. Instead, what we're going to do, try and do is look for projections of the data. So that's um, projections of the form A transposed X, linear projections that maximize the separation of the populations. They make it easiest for us to, t uh, to see the difference between the multiple different populations we have. So that's the aim of Fisher's linear discriminant analysis, to find these projections, the choices of A, that maximize the separation of the populations. So just as before, let's assume that we have data x1j up to xnj j from population j. Okay. Then there are various matrices we're going to use to compute uh, Fisher's discriminant analysis. And it's based upon a decomposition of the total covariance matrix. So if S here is the total covariance matrix. So that's the covariance matrix we would normally compute. Okay, so it's the sum over j, the sum over i of x, i j minus x bar, x i j minus x bar, transposed. Yep, just a normal thing, one over n of that. So that's the total covariance matrix, S. And we're going to split that into two parts. We're going to split it into a within class variance. So this is the matrix we've seen already uh, earlier as our estimator of capital sigma. So what that is, is the covariance matrix for population J times the number of elements in, uh, in our test set, a training set for population J divided by N. Okay, so that gives us a within class variance, an estimator of sigma, if we were thinking about multivariate normals. Then the other matrix is what we call the between class variance. And that is, there should be an NJ in here, I've left out. So that is the difference between the mean, the estimated mean for population J and the global mean. So X bar here is a global mean, the mean of all the data. Okay, when we sum across the I from one to NJ and J from one to G, so we sum across all the um, observations for each uh, population, then across all the populations, so that's a, the global mean. And so the between class variance matrix is the difference between the estimated means and the global means times the estimated means and the same thing transposed, okay, times by the number of elements in each class. And what I show in the notes and what Fisher showed is that we can decompose the variance, the total covariance, into a within class variance and a between class variance. So you've seen the same kind of thing before in univariate statistics when you did analysis of variance. Yeah, you've seen the same kind of calculations before. So Fisher's approach is to try and find a projection of the data. So to take each data point, let's call them xi, okay, and project them onto some vector a. Okay, or in, in vector form, if I want to write all the z's um, in one go, I could do this as x transposed. Uh, x transposed a, okay, where x is our normal uh, data matrix. Now if we think about the variance of the zi's, this is going to be the variance of a transposed xi, which is going to be a transposed the variance of xi times a which is A transposed S A, which is A transposed W A plus A transposed B A. 
So again, we split the variance of z up into a within class variance and a between class variance. So Fisher, his approach was to say we should choose A to maximize the ratio of the between class variance to the within class variance. Or mathematically, what we want to do is we maximize with respect to our choice A of A transposed B A times divided by A transposed W A. And if we think about that, why would we want to do that? Well, we want to choose A to separate these cl classes or populations. So if we maximize the between class variance, that pushes things apart. But we also want the, the populations to be clustered close together. So we want to minimize the within class variance. So this is a way of doing both at the same time. We want to make the between class variance big, the within class variance small. And this criteria will do that. Well, how do we do that? Well, ju just note that if A is a solution, then multiplying by A by any constant isn't going to change anything. So if, you know, if, I, if I look at uh, C times A in here, well, C, C A transpose B C A divided by C A transpose W C A. Well, all these C's are going to cancel out. Okay, so it doesn't make any difference if I multiply A by anything. So the equivalent problem is we can maximize A transpose B A subject to A transpose W A equal one. So that's just the scaling on A. And we've seen this kind of trick before in the earlier chapters, particularly the PCA chapter. We've seen objectives like this before as well. So the way we're going to solve this is much like we solved the, the optimization problem in CCA. So if we write that B is, let's have it as the matrix square root of A, then the optimization problem becomes maximize. Well, if we um, if we write a as uh, w to the minus a half of b, so the matrix inverse square root, uh, ma and substitute that into here, we're going to get maximize b transpose w inverse square root b w inverse square root b subject to well if we substitute uh, a this the w is going to cancel so we just get b transpose b equals one we've seen this before this is a proposition when we look at the singular value decomposition and we know that the solution to this say b equal to b1 which is the eigenvector of w to the minus half b w to the minus half corresponding to the largest eigenvalue so that's going to make a equal to well if we substitute in um here okay so a is going to be w to the minus a half b1 okay so that, that solved our problem now we can solve it more easily by noting that a is an eigenvector of w inverse b so let's check that so if i do w inverse b of a well that is w and then i will split w inverse into the square uh, the inverse square root times the inverse square root yep so that's w inverse and then i've got b substitute in my expression for a i go that w inverse b1 now v1 is an eigenvector of this 
So I get this being w to the minus a half of lambda v1. So I get lambda a back again. Okay, so what we've done here, we've said that to solve this optimization problem, what we have to do is find the eigenvalues of W inverse B. Yeah, we wrote down the optimization problem, we solved it to say that, well, it's the eigenvector of this. But what we've noted is that the solution is also an eigenvector of W inverse B, and that's going to be easier to work with. So that's what we're going to do in practice. We're going to form this matrix W inverse B, and we're going to find its eigenvectors. So Fisher's discriminant rule uses the function L of X, which is A transposed X. And we assign X to population uh, J according to how far L of X is from each of the projections of the population means. Okay. So we compute L of um, mu 1 hat up to L of mu G hat. Okay. And we assign X to population J if the distance between L of X and L mu J hat is less than all the other distances. Okay, for I not equal to J. So in other words, we write that the Fisher's discriminant rule can be written as the value, the argument that minimizes right to K L X minus L mu j hat. In the case there's only two populations, if g equals to 2 here, then this is equivalent to saying we classify to population 1 if L of x is bigger than some threshold, okay. um, and population 2 otherwise, where the threshold is just the midpoint between the projection of the population mean uh, for population one and the population mean for population two. Okay, so let's look at some pictures of this. So back to our iris example. And again, I've just got the situation where I've just got two species of flower, Setosa and Virginica, as before. And I'm just looking at two of the, um, the variables, sepal length and sepal width. The black points here are the Setosa data and the green are the Virginica data. So what we're trying to do is find a vector A on which to project these points. So what I plotted here is the first eigenvector found when we do Fisher's um, linear discriminant analysis. Now I've shifted it. Uh, so it doesn't go through the origin, just for ease of making the plot a bit nicer. Okay, But it's a vector in this direction. And each of these points is orthogonally projected on to this line. So this point here goes to this point here. This green one goes there. Okay? And so on. This green point, the most extreme, goes down here. So it's a projection of these points onto here. Now what Fisher's discriminant analysis does is find the angle of this line that maximizes the between group variance divided by the within group variance. Okay, so it finds the optimal directional line, and that's this line in this case. So the plus here is the population mean in each case, and this is the average of the two population means, so the global mean. And I've also projected those points down. So the way Fisher's discriminant analysis works is just to classify each point according to which projected mean it is closest to. So these values on here are my L of X's. This is my L mu 1. This is my L mu 2. So I've projected the points on here 
the midpoint between them is the red uh, diamond here. And so essentially our classification rule says, if you lie this side, classify to Setosa. If you lie this side, classify to Virginia. And just by way of comparison, let's think about a different angle line here. So I've picked the line found by principal component analysis. Yeah. So this is the line that maximizes the variance in the projections. Yeah, so the total variance. So this is my principal component analysis. And these are my projections of the first PC scores are the values along this line. And you can see that we haven't separated the classes so nicely. There's much more overlap here um, between the black and green points. As you expect, PCA isn't designed to separate these classes. PCA is designed to maximize variance. And so that's what we've done here. So Fisher's discriminant analysis finds the angle of this line that maximizes the separation between these two populations. Or mathematically, what it does, it maximizes the ratio of the between group variance to the within group variance. So what we've done so far is to solve the optimization problem where we maximize the ratio A transpose B A over A transpose W A. We say that that solves by the first eigenvector of W inverse B, which I've called V1. Now, just like we did in PCA and CCA, we don't have to just take a single projection. We can think about taking multiple different projections of the data. So if we let our matrix A have columns where the first column is V1, you know, the solution to this problem, and the second column is V2, the second eigenvector, and up to VR, so uh, let's say VR here is the rth eigenvector of W inverse B. Then if we think about the projection of X onto this, so uh, A transpose X, so this is a vector in RR, and it's a projection of X, which was started off in RP, remember, into RR which maximizes separability of the populations. Okay, so if we do this, our function L is now a vector, so if it's A transposed X, and our discriminant rule, which is our Fisher's discriminant rule, is just going to classify a point X to the population um, for which minimizes the, let's say the Euclidean distance between L of X and L of new K hat. Okay, so it's exactly the same as before, but now th these these here aren't scalars, they're vectors, so we just take say the Euclidean distance between them. So this is a form of dimension reduction, right? So just like PCA was doing some form of dimension reduction and CCA, LDA is linear discriminant analysis is also doing dimension reduction. But the aim of dimension reduction is not to maximize variance like it was in PCA or to maximize correlation like it was in CCA. It's instead to maximize the separability of these populations. And let's just think about how many projections we can find here. Well, well we're computing eigenvectors of W inverse B. Now, B and W are both um, going to be P by P, so they're at most rank P. The rank of B in particular is, is less than or equal to uh, G minus one, where G is the number of groups. And if you think about why that is, mu one minus um, X bar up to mu G minus X bar, uh, lie in a G minus one dimensional space. Yeah, because they sum up to zero, so they can't be in a G dimensional space. And B here was one over N, the sum 
of nj uh, mu j minus x bar mu j minus x bar transposed so the rank of b is at most g minus one so the most we can do is take uh, g minus one different projection to the data 